Good morning, everybody, and it's a Builders Live. It's 11 o'clock on a Thursday, and guys, it's been a good spring, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Um, there's been some rain in some parts. I know that the Cape has nearly been blown away, but you've had some beautiful, beautiful days. Um, it's been spectacular. In KZN, we have had so much rain. I've kind of like, oh, can I even say this? Could I say that I've had a little bit enough of it, just a wee bit? Um, but spring is in full swing, guys. Um, your gardens should be looking spectacular. No, don't pull those faces. No, come on, guys. I know they should be looking spectacular. Um, they really, really should be. But anyway, folks, um, it really is a pleasure to be with you for the next hour. Uh, remember that I'm here to answer your questions, whatever you're needing. Um, that's why I'm here. So bang them away. Talk to us. We want to talk to you. Uh, remember, folks, that today we are speaking about perennials and it's, it's the power of the perennial. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next few minutes. But first of all, I want to see who's here, who's saying hello and where you are, because um, that's always most important. So, guys, let's have a look here. Bonnie is from a cool hillcrest. Yes, it is cool. When I took my jersey off just like a few minutes ago, it was like brrr. Um, William, good morning. Billy, good morning um, from Cape Town. Um, Favour, good morning from Edenvale. Uh, um, uh, where, Billy, you're from Arlette. No, or was it Arlette from Cape Town? Arlette, okay. I think you're on somebody else's thingy. Okay. Um, Debbie, good morning from a cold, wet and windy UK. Oh, oh shame, Debbie. Oh, okay, just go outside and... <laughs> Blow the clouds away. You've got to get rid of them. Um, Isway, good morning. Princess, good morning. Marita, good morning. Um, Annalie and Peters, um, good morning from Peter Maritzburg. Uh, Yanni Fasaki, Akos Oagir, Moisua. Geraldine, I see there's a question coming through from Geraldine, but we will get to that in a few minutes. Sibo Sisu, um, we've got Delia from Santon. Good morning, Delia. I'm going to be up in your neck of the woods on Saturday. Um, yeah, there's an event that we're going to there on Saturday. Um, Peritage Mokane, good morning from Paula Kwani. Felicity from Ganubi, East London. Chris, good to see you back. Chris Herbst from Sunning Hill, Joburg. Um, who else have we got here? Kerry Stain, Rudling. Kerry, is that like, as in Kerry Rudling? Is that in the Rudling that I used to know? That I did know? Kerry, is that you? Kerry, tell me that's you, Kerry Rudling, who used to work for that garden centre that we both worked for. If it is you, man, I'm sending you lots of love because there are not many Kerry Rudlings. I hope it is. Viz, good morning. Good morning, Viz. Um, Vinishri Reddy, good morning from a, a lovely day here in Durban. Wait, where are you? You're in Durban. Are you sure you're in Durban? Because it ain't so lovely up here. It's a bit overcast and a bit cold. Um, Lynn Davis, good morning from Breders Dorp, Dorp, 10 minutes from Napir. Oh, Jason Colleen Pele from a Snowy Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that cold? Is it that cold? Bonnie, um, oh my goodness, let's see. Uh, Miss Heidi Stevens from Boxburg. Yes, good morning. Uh, Lynn Nicholson from Alberton had a terrible, no. Lynn Nicholson from Alberton had a terrible hailstorm last night. All my roses destroyed. Urgh. Lynn, hang tight. I'm going to give you some advice. Because if you remember a few months ago, yeah, it was it. It seems like the other day. Those memories in my head. Um, a few months ago, we had a horrid hailstorm here. Um, really horrid. Um, but I'm going to give you some tips on how to deal with that. So do not despair. Do not despair. All is not lost. Um, Roz Baldwin, good morning from Port Elizabeth. Yes, it's you, Kerry, it's you. Oh, my word. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Oh, my word. Oh, sending you love. You were a fantastic creature, and you still are. And that, yeah, big heart, big heart. Sending love to you and your family. Has the brood grown? I'm sure it might have. I'm sure it might have. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness, goodness. Okay, I'm having a moment. Sorry, just let me have my moment. Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. Um, Sybil from Durbanville, Malebu from Camperdown. Ah, Sheila Scott from a glorious Cape Town. Oh, oh. Beverly from the Bluff. Jane, good morning from Cape Town. Um, Delia from Santon. Right, guys, 
Let us, who is Adrian Chapman? Good morning. Also from Cape Town. Woo, lots of Cape Townians here today. Okay. Um, yeah, you've had enough rain on the bluff, says Vinishri. I, I get it. I get it. Um, and I see their questions coming through already. Burn from the from Mandini. Good morning. Good morning. Um, sure, guys. Um, Ballot from Debbie from Centurion. Um, yo, guys. And for Faraja, Faraja Gabaz. Faraja, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. From Botswana. Hoo hoo. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Faraza, thank you. <laughs> um, some people like the cold weather, Sheila says. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got a cousin who hates the heat. He really does. And when it's like three, three days of sunshine, he's like, oh, no, really. Yeah, I know some people do. And yeah. let me tell you, if the temperature drops below 25 here in Asaga, we start a fire inside. Yeah. It's kind of like one of those things. In excuse to light fire inside. Um, all right, guys. So we're talking perennials today, and um, and I want to I want to touch on on the one question which was about the um, the hail. Now, when you've had the hail damage, um, I know it, you're, it's terribly depressing. I mean, literally, I went through two or three days of complete terrible, terrible, utter depression because. Everything looks so completely ruined, but I'll tell you there are a whole lot of positives that come out of this. Number one is that the plants recover quickly. Plants are really tough and they will surprise you. They continue to surprise me. And with the hail, I was, I was, actually I have no words to, to say how, how quickly the garden recovered. And we underestimate plants. Uh, we really, really do. So they do recover very, very quickly. Um, number two, the amount of nitrogen that has been put into your soil right now. Man, it is so, so much. So when those plants do push through and they start recovering, they are going to look the best that they have ever, ever looked. True story. So what I want you to do for the next three days is nothing. I don't want you to do anything in the garden. I want you just to wait till you can assess the damage. Three days at least, if you can hang on for a fourth day, take an extra pill, please do that. But just hang in there and let the garden just kind of settle. You will see the bruising and the damaging starting to come through. And that's important because you want to do this work once. You want to get out there when you've got to do the corrective pruning and do it once. After the four or five days, if you can hang in there, then you're going to get out there with your pair of secateurs, your strongest gardening tool ever, and you are going to prune the plants back. You're going to remove the leaves that have fallen on the ground. Okay, you're going to remove those because you don't want to leave rose leaves on the floor because that can create fungal infections and potential areas for disease. So take that all away, pop that onto the compost heap, and then you want to start pruning. And you want to prune away all the dead that the bruised, the damaged, the bent, the broken stems. You really want to do that. And if, with your roses, if you've got to prune quite hard, it's fine. Prune them back hard. Um, and then, most importantly, a spray. Okay, because where you've got lesions, it's just the same as us. If we get a cut or a scrape and we don't clean it um, and we don't put an antiseptic on it and we don't look after it, it can cause infection. It can get infected. And that's exactly the same where you have lesions and um, and bruising on stems and especially on roses. So it's important to start to spray with um, any general rose protector. And I would probably, I would recommend at this point to go with a rose care. Just use a rose care, it's a, it's a fungal and an insecticide. Spray that once a week um, until your plants start that recovery process because then if there is any disease lying around there or waiting to get into any of those crevices you know that you've got it. Okay, so just take a deep breath. It will be okay. It really will be okay. Kimbini has joined us from Hazy View in Mapumalanga. Annaline, um, uh, oh, what, what, Annaline, I bought the Get Off Crystals. My pup's still messing in the garden. Am I doing something wrong? Annaline, you've got to put the Get Off Crystals down often like daily, okay? So wherever your pup decides now that it's going like over here, put down the crystals. It's then gonna go somewhere else. So you've got, to, you've got to repeat the process and it's also all about repetition. And dogs learn, like people, through repetition. So 
when you are taking pup out to go for its ablutions, take it to a spot where you want it to ablute, okay? Preferably not in the garden bed. So take it to the spot where you want it to ablute, keep there, have patience, hang around in that area, make sure that the dog doesn't leave that area. And once you've done that, once you have got that into the pup, that that is the place for ablutions, you'll probably find that the garden won't really be that inviting anymore. Okay. Um, so Maya, good morning from Cape Town. Thelma from Montclair. Um, Junaid is here from Johannesburg, four ways. Um, okay, there's a question coming through. I'm going to get to that just now. Uh, right, okay. Let's talk about the power perennials, guys. Now, uh, the definition of a perennial is a plant that will go on and on and on. Okay, how long is on and on and on? It depends entirely on the plant, on the plant. So some perennials will live for two, three years. Others will live for five, six, seven, eight, even ten. So we get soft perennials and we get harder perennials. And it's important for us to understand the difference so that we're not disappointed when we buy the plant. And maybe what I can use as, a, as an example without bashing the plant um, is, is this over here. So, so we've all seen these beautiful petunias in our local builders. I mean, yeah, they don't look quite as big as this, but when you buy them, um, they're probably looking like this. Okay, like this guy in the pot over here. They're probably looking like this. Spectre, I mean, isn't this guy amazing? Isn't it amazing? I think this one's called Midnight Sky. Yeah, Night Sky, look at it. I mean, it looks like somebody went with like a paintball. That's quite insane. It's been on the market for, sure, available to us gardeners for about three years. And if some of you haven't seen it yet, sure, get out there and get it. And remember that petunias have a fragrance. They have the sweetness, um, beautiful, sweet fragrance. Okay, so when you buy them, they look like this. And it tells you that it is a perennial. Okay, it tells us it's a perennial. Okay, which means in my head, and probably in your head, that it's going to live forever and ever and ever. No, 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 nothing lives forever. So, when you are planting what we call petunias, which are soft perennials, I, 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 I definitely I put them into that category. If your petunia, like we've planted them up in this metal bucket, which I actually picked up at my local builders, it's gorgeous, and I drilled some holes in it, and then planted up the petunia in it. I love it, I love it, I love it. But the point is, folks, that if this goes on in your garden for two years, for two seasons, as a perennial, it has done exceptionally well. Yeah, it's done exceptionally well. Especially if you are in summer rainfall areas um, and even the winter rainfall areas, like in the Cape during the winter, these guys are not happy, okay? Because petunias and rain just don't go hand in hand. They really don't like each other, which is why they always look better during the drier winter months um, and down in the Western Cape in the drier summer months. That's when they're really at their best. So as a perennial, yes, for two years, hundreds, I've got my bit out of it. Perfect. And the same would be for a little daisy bush. Lovely little daisy bushes, which are probably one of the best perennials that you can ever lay your hands on. And I know people say, oh, it's so common, it's so common. But guys, a daisy bush is something for me that there's always a surprise. There, there really always is a beautiful surprise. And the colors that they are available in now, from a, a deep, deep pink that almost looks red, um, to this, this, I mean, look at this in here. Come in close here, look at that color. Look at that color. Isn't that insane? It looks like it's been dipped in something. I, I just love it. I, I, I couldn't help myself from not picking it up. It really is spectacular. And if we're wanting some instant gratification, Okay, it's not quite instant, but you put this plant in, it really looks like something, and you give it three months in the garden, and it's double, tripled its size. That is what I call gratification in gardening. And if you've ever got holes or spots in the garden that just aren't doing it for you, and you need a bit of something, then pop in a little daisy bush. Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to come back to it, we're going to talk about care of them, and how to make sure that they go on and on and on. But whilst we are here, come along with me here and let's talk about these petunias because I've seen too many petunias die a very slow death. Mm, yes, quite slow, yes. So um, 
Remember, in order to get the most out of them, we do they, they do need some kind of care, okay? If they're in a container, guys, you've got to feed them. Give them food, okay? They need nutrition. If you need to make so many flowers, think about the plant. You've got to create so many flowers. So I'm going to call it a smile. I'm going to call one flower a smile, and I'm going to give it a minute. One flower, one minute, one smile. Let's come, just stick with me, stick with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one. 40, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. Okay, I might have recounted that one. Let's stick with 40. 40 flowers. 40 flowers. Looking amazing. Beautiful. Smiling, smiling, smiling. Can you smile for 40 minutes? without interruption. No, you're going to need a break. You're going to need to take a sip of water. You're going to need a, like a breathe, breath or something. And that's, that's it with flowers. We are expecting these guys to go on and on and on and on and on without the support that they need. So what do they need? Remember, petunias need loads of sun, lots and lots of sun. Try and Put them in positions that don't get hammered by wind. And I know for you folks that live on the coast, that is quite difficult. But, you know, either just, just on this side of a wall or, or just sheltered from another large shrub um, will do the job for you. But importantly, what we need to know is this. Now, come in here and take a look. Um, so look over here. You see that flower's on its way out. He's gone. He's done his job. He's flowered. Okay. So there was, there was our flower, okay? Those things around there are called the sepals, okay? There's the little sepals. And then here's the stem. You can see the stem. And in there, can you see in there? I don't know. Oh, are we in there? You can see in there is the new shoots. The, here are the new little shoots. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your thumb and forefinger, follow it all the way down, and simply just nip it. Okay, now look what's left. Look what's left there. So we're down to those new, there's the new growth coming for the new set of flowers. So let's choose one that's closer so you can get a better look at it. Um, let's go in here. Same thing, guys, same thing. In fact, look how developed these, this new set of leaves is. There was the flower, okay. There's the little sepals, there's the stem, so we're going to take our thumb and forefinger all the way down and simply just nip it off. Okay, that is what you want left. That there. Okay, not this. Don't do this. Okay, not this. This is not just pulling off the flower and leaving that behind. That is not deadheading. Okay guys, that's not deadheading. Right, so you've got to take this little guy off. When we take that little guy off, what we're doing is we're encouraging more lateral, lateral growth and we're encouraging more flowers, which is what we want this beauty to do. And after the few days of rain that we've been having up here, sure, looks like I've got a lot of deadheading to do here. Oh, and by the way, what we've just done now, that's called deadheading. Okay, so there are two. Sure. And that's what we've got to do, guys, in order to keep them going. And remember, the most important thing I spoke to you about is feeding. Please give them food. Give them a liquid plant food preferably because a liquid plant food not only gets taken up by the leaves of the plant as you are either watering it in or putting it in with a little spray bottle. So that's called foliar feeding. The nutrition gets taken up by the leaves through the stomata, which is underneath the leaves. There's these little pores. It gets taken up by that. But also that that then drips into the soil also then feeds the soil. So it's a two-way process. Um, and foliar feeding generally has a much quicker reaction because it's going directly into the plant's um, leaves. The plants react much, much quicker. Um, by no means am I bashing granular fertil fertilizers or fertilizers that you put around the soil. They just take a bit longer. So what I would do is I would give it a double action. Put some granular fertilizer around the plant and also do the liquid feed in order to keep them going. And that's the trick with perennials. They're hungry, they want to perform, because that's what they are bred to do. They're bred to perform and look amazing, but we've got to give them the right nutrition. Okay, very, very important. All right, I want to come to this, this little daisy bush here. Now, 
Um, some of you might have planted a daisy bush, and I've got a pair of secateurs somewhere. And um, the biggest thing with, um, with, with perennials is that if we let them go on in the garden for a long, long time, okay, so they've gone on without this pruning that we talk about, and especially perennials like a daisy. And I'm going to I'm going to put quite a few plants here to give you a group so that you can start to learn the association of what I call tougher perennials. So these are perennials that are longer lasting. These are the ones that I talk three to four years. Okay, so we've got that guy over there. Um, we're going to put a Shasta daisy in that group as well. I'm also going to put a Coleus in that group there as well. Um, what else am I going to put in here? Uh, I'm going to put a geranium in this group as well. Now, these plants, these plants all are what we call the medium, yeah, medium to long forms of perennials. So these will go on in your garden for years and years and years, three, four, five years, even depending on how you look after them. But here's the point, it's about the looking after. So we plant them in their first season, they grow, they look amazing. I mean, your daisy is beautiful, thick like this, lovely, all covered in foliage right from the base to the top. The second season, if we haven't pruned them, they start to get a bit leggy. Yeah, you know, we end up seeing stems and then a few flowers. Yeah, like stems and just, or, lee, or stems and then just a few leaves. And they look really poor. They, they look like they need a good haircut. And that's exactly what they need, guys. They need a good haircut. Okay, so you have seen these plants. You have seen this and this growing in a garden. And by the time you open the plant up and you look inside the stem, the stem is thick and woody. Woody, woody, woody. And if you open it up, you will actually see the new growth starting to try and push through. And that's what we need to pay attention to, that new growth that's trying to push through. So, when do you prune perennials? Because that's going to be the next question. You prune the perennial directly after flowering. Okay, so your daisies, winter flowering, early spring, okay, it's sometimes going to be difficult to actually find a time when to prune it, but I'm going to ask you to use this as your general guide. When your daisy bush starts opening up and almost falling open because it's now got, it's, it's, it's got too much growth, um, sometimes they've got too long and leggy and the little bit of green growth that's on the top is actually pulling it apart and sometimes they look very scraggly. That is when you need to get out your pair of secateurs. Now, ideally what you want to do is keep pruning regularly. So that would be on an annual basis. If you haven't done that though, and you've got a big, bushy, woody plant with hardly any leaves coming up the stem, few leaves on the top, then please folks, I want you to do the following. And you've got to do this because I know some of you have pruned them. You know, when spring fever comes, you're like, prune, 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 prune. I mean, any plant in that garden, I think, and it happens, it happens. When we get pruning fever, we go wild, man. We just want to prune everything. I think some of the plants even duck and they say, oh my God, yeah, she comes. Be careful, be careful, she's coming. Okay, so, so just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Okay, so this is the scenario if your plant has got woody, long and leggy, okay, Hardly any leaves on the, on the stem and a few leaves on the top. Now remember, leaves are the power source. That's the energy. That's the way the plants, that's the, the, the engine room. Without good leaves, you're not going to get good flowers. Quite simple. Just like a rose. Without good leaves, you're not going to get good flowers. All right. So in that case, I want you to do the following. Now this is tried and tested. Guys, this, this method has been used for generations and it works. If this is your plant... I want you to take half of the plant. Do you see that? This part here. Half of the plant. Not half this way. Half of the plant going down vertically. And this would also, the same would apply to a lavender. If you've had your lavender bushes for a long, 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 long time, they're hard and woody stemmed, they're falling over, they're leaning over, they're just not looking good, then this is the same method of pruning that you would do. What you're going to do is you would prune away 
down to a fresh set of leaves. If you don't have a fresh set of leaves, you are simply going to prune to the nearest leaf. Or if you don't even have leaves, then you've got to be very brave and prune down just halfway on that naked stem. Halfway on that naked stem, okay? But remember, you, you're still keeping, you've still got the other half of the bush here. Okay, so, right, we've pruned half of the plant. We've reduced the plant by half, and we have pruned half. Okay, now imagine if this was that, I was, I've been talking about it a lot, the woody stems, because I know they exist in all of our gardens. Long woody stems, you would do exactly the same. You would prune down by half, preferably to a node. Okay, a, a, a node, what is a node? It's where you ru run your finger along the stem and you'll feel a little bump. Okay, that is a node where there's potentially going to be growth. And when we prune, we encourage and the plant snaps into action and it says, yes, I need to grow. So we've pruned half the plant. Now what you're going to do is you're going to wait. You're going to be patient. You're going to wait for this part to start growing. Let it show signs of growth. Let it start bushing out. When it starts growing and it shows signs of recovery, you're then going to prune the other half. Okay? Like that. In that way, you will not end up killing your plant. I promise you. Because I have seen too many daisy bushes, too many lavenders, too many poor geraniums. Oh, and this is a geranium, by the way, and I'm going to talk about it just now. But aren't those colors wicked? I mean, it's just too gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. But we've pruned it too hard, and literally, you are down to stalks like this, just two sticks. And some of you are even still watering those sticks. But they're long gone. They have gone to heaven long, long, long ago. Okay, so uh, that's the way that I want you to prune your perennials. And remember, if you can prune your perennials once a year, that would be great. And you will see, they will start telling you when they need. They will start immediately telling you when they start losing vigor, they're not flowering as much, and you find that the bases end up starting to get a bit naked. The same would apply to a plant like this, which is a gora. Okay. We've seen the goras. You get the pink, you get the white. A firm favorite in us South African gardens. It, it's a firm, firm favorite. But we know this plant is quite enthusiastic. It gets like that big. Down in the Cape, it can even get bigger because um, it, it really it loves the coastal areas and wide. A very, very big plant. But you'll find that with your gora, it goes up, 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 and then it starts falling over. Yep, it starts actually like splitting and falling over. What is the plant telling you? It's telling you it needs to get pruned because it cannot cope. The root system and the top are not in line. So you've got to prune the foliage in order to get it back in line. And what we call, this is regenerative pruning, we are going to regenerate it and invigorate and give it new opportunity. And we do that by pruning. Now, goras, if they are hard and woody, like I was explaining with the daisy, guys, you do the same thing. If it's a young plant and it's only in its second year, then you can prune, then you can prune. Normally, just straight down. Okay, halfway down. Right, I believe there are loads of questions coming through, so let's have a look. Um, Favoured says, is it true that sugar should be poured onto the fruit tree roots to make, oh, no, no, to make your fruit, your, your, the fruit of your citrus sweet? Is that a true story? No. Favoured, I think someone was pulling your leg there. Um, and I would personally, if somebody is going to give um, sweeties, rather give them to you or to me. So not to the plants. The plants do not need, need that. What is missing is nutrition. Nutrition, which is plant food, makes and determines the sweetness of your fruit as well as water. Water, which is the lifeblood of everything. So... In order to ensure that you've got good fruit, sweet fruit, well-developed fruit, you need to make sure that you are watering your plant, a good watering once every 10 days, once a week. If you're not having rain, is more than enough. But I mean a good deep watering. When I talk about a deep watering, I'm talking like a good few liters, maybe 10 liters, two buckets around the plant. 
What we want to encourage is deep roots, not shallow surface roots. When you water just like one liter or two liters, you, if you had to go dig in that soil, you will see that only the top layer is wet. Only your top layer of soil is wet. That's not good enough. Our roots are down there. And we rather want to encourage good deep roots rather than shallow surface roots. Okay, and fertilize. Fertilize. What can you fertilize with? Well, we've got some great examples here. Um, I'm going to show you this. This is probably one of your best go-to products, um, Atlantic Bio Ocean. Folks, this has got um, seaweed in it, and it's a, 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 a chicken litter as well. Put a good few handfuls around your plant every four to six weeks. Um, and you can also use Vita fruit and flowering, which is a good 315, also an organic option, which works brilliantly. Either of these guys, you are going to be very, very safe. Okay, so have a look out for these at your local builders and fertilize. Plants need the nutrition. I can't spell it out enough. I really can't. Um, next question is, Lynn asks, how do I transplant ruscus? Ooh. Mm. Without destroying the plants, and get rid of all the roots that are left behind. It's a mat of roots. They were next to the leathery ferns, which seems to have blue-colored fungus on their roots. Should I treat the soil? Mm. Okay, no, no. Lynn, um, any, if you've got a fungus near the, the roots, um, and it's, it's not a white uh, insect-like looking fluffy stuff, then don't, leave, leave that. That's a good fungus, okay? Leave that. What I do want to say to you is that it's going to happen that your leathery fern is going to outgrow your ruscus in terms of, of heart for heart because ruscus is very, very slow. That's why we pay so much for it at the florists. I mean, have you ever bought a bunch of ruscus? I think it's like 80 bucks or something. It's expensive. So ruscus is shade loving. It's very slow. But let me tell you, if you pick those leaves, you can put them in a vase and they can last for months. Literally months, six, eight, 12 weeks they can last in the vase. So how do you prune it? Or not prune it, how do you move it? What I want you to do is I want you to prune, and you're going to have to do this. There's ain't no getting around this one. You're going to have to prune the foliage. Prune it halfway back. So check the plant's growth. If it's this tall, prune it back to there. Because you cannot transplant it, disturb the roots like that, and not adjust the machine, which is the foliage part. The plant is just not going to cope very well. So into your hole, your transplanting. Remember, good compost in. Make sure that it's well drained. Add in some fertilizer. Transplant your ruscus on a cool, cloudy day because it stresses the plant out far less. Okay, cool, cloudy day. Not in the heat of the day. Or else early morning and late afternoon. Transplant it. Keep it well watered and you will soon find that the guy will recover. But yeah, it's going to be slow, and there's no easy way around that, I'm afraid. No easy way. Okay. Um, Penny wants to know, what can I put around clivias? Oh, clivias are looking gorgeous at the moment, aren't they? I think they love the cold winter. Um, now, our clivias in the garden are looking fantastic. And uh, remember, after the clivia flowers, in eight, nine months' time, you are going to get the most beautiful plump red seed which you must harvest so when the seed is red and and like almost soft to touch when you can squish it a bit and um, then you know that it's ready to harvest harvest that seed um, and then you can grow your own baby clivias and it's really easy um, so what can you put around clivias clivias are, are very easy there there are a couple of things that i do want you to note though clivias come from the coastal forests and inland forests of South Africa. That's where they are grown. That's where they are the happiest. They're indigenous. Um, so riverine forests, what we call. So think about our garden. That's what we want to create. We want to create that environment for where they can live. And when you think of a forest, you think of the following words of coolness, of damp, of spongy under your feet when you walk. So that's what we want to emulate with our clivias. And the way we can do that as gardeners is we can make sure that we mulch them. So mulching is important. Mulching means you're going to mulch with your own compost, right, that you've homemade. You're going to take, 
Like if we have pruned these, guys, take these, cut them up a bit more, and pop them onto your, onto your compost heap, okay? So that they then start breaking down. But I like it being quite chunky. Because when you think about a forest, um, the leaves fall as large leaves, and they fall onto the ground. And then that starts breaking up. So if you've got a tree that's dropping leaves, take those leaves. Take them and put them around your clavier to form that beautiful thick layer of mulch that we're wanting. If you have been cutting your lawn and you've got lawn clippings, take your lawn clippings and put them around your clavier as well. Okay? No, it's not going to take all the nitrogen out of the soil and it's not going to bring extra hojos and nunus to your garden. No, it's not. Do it and you will see amazing difference because... By putting a layer of mulch like this on your soil, you're protecting it from the sun's rays. When you scrape it away, even on the hottest of days, and you feel that soil underneath, it will still be cool because the mulch protects it. It's almost like sunscreen, you know, just like sunscreen. Factor 50. The question is, what do I put around my cliviers? Well, you could use the Atlantic. You could use Atlantic by Ocean. Would really encourage good flowering. And I would also even recommend the Talborn fruit and flowers because look, the fruit and flowers, guys, um, I'll bring it to you here, has that big end number. Okay, do you see that number five there? Now that big end number, and this isn't organic, means that it's going to encourage flowering. Okay, the big number at the end means it's got a lot of potassium. Potassium encourages flowering, fruiting and flowering. So... That would be a good one to use, um, and it's a great organic product. So there we go, folks. Um, uh, you are need Naomi. Um, good morning from Johannesburg Four Ways. I have a curry leaf tree in a pot, and the winter has damaged it. Ooh, can you assist in reviving it or advise on to replant from cuttings? E. Okay, curry leaf trees. They part of. Um, the citrus family, actually, um, same same family, and I'm surprised that even in the pot that it got damaged, gosh, now you must have had some severe frost then. So if it's been damaged um, in the pot, what I would do is just give it a good feeding. I, I wouldn't encourage giving it a pruning at this stage because uh, you and I don't know how big this plant is, but if it's a small plant in a pot, then. I'm not going to advise pruning at all. If it's slightly larger and there are some leaves there, are some leaves, and you find that you've got bare stems at the top, then prune away those bare stems down to foliage. Okay, but if you've just got bare stems, what are you going to do? Think about back to the daisy bush. Ah, yes. Then you're going to prune half of the plant and wait for that to start growing. And then you will only prune the other half. Okay, and curry leaf trees are very slow. So don't expect miracles. They are very, very slow growing, um, which is why they're so difficult to get hold of. But feed it with a good organic fertilizer, one or two handfuls around it, and it will cert certainly be able to bounce back in no time at all. Um, don't overwater it. Curry leaf trees don't like overwatering. Okay, so um, yeah, that's what I would suggest that you do. But, um, but don't be... Don't be too heavy on the pruning on that. Follow the same example that I spoke about with the daisy bush. Okay. Um, Marlene, I was given daffodils in a pot. Oh, you lucky, lucky, lucky lady. What do I do with the bulbs? Okay. Marlene, daffodils in a pot. What a beautiful gift. And as we know, daffodils are spring flowering. And they would have gone over by now. They flower for about a week. They have now finished flowering. And you're left with the stem. Don't stress, don't stress. You can revive these guys. So what I want you to do, and this is the rule with any bulbs in the garden, any bulbs that you have planted and have finished flowering, is allow them to die back. So the flower dies first and you leave it. Please don't go and cut it off. It's the one thing you don't cut off. Just leave it. Okay, and I know it's hard because they can sometimes kind of look a bit scraggly and a bit untidy, but just leave it. All right, and then you're going to let that stem start dying back. As it dies back, what's going to happen is all the nutrition and energy is going to go back where? Into the bulb, of course. Yes. As the flower dies, as the stem starts dying, all that nutrition is then going back into the bulb, giving the bulb the energy it needs for the following year. 
Okay, so Marlene, what you can do is you can leave it in the pot. You can leave the defs in, in the little pot, but I probably would, because it's probably a small pot, I would recommend you either plant them into the garden or once they have died down, you can take them out, dust them off and put them in a brown paper bag in a cool, dark spot, like a linen cupboard, somewhere in the garage. Just remember where you put them. You know, write yourself a post-it note or a, or a something or tie your shoelaces in a funny way because I promise you, they're like silkworms. You'll forget where you put them and then you'll open up the cupboard and like, Whoa, they're my bulbs. Ah! You, do you remember silkworms? <laughs> my mother, my poor mother. You know, the only way we knew they'd hatched was because on the outside of the cupboard, you'd have these little black things moving, these small little black little things like, oh my gosh, the silkworms have hatched. Oh, goodness me, what a story. Okay, so um, yes, you can take the bulbs out, but I would recommend, so you've got two options here. Is one, plant them into a slightly bigger pot, just with some good potting soil. Leave them outside, and then you don't water them at all. You just leave them. Leave them out there, and that's it. Next season, as soon as they start shooting, as soon as they start shooting, you give them a handful of good organic fertilizer, okay? As soon as they start shooting. Or you've then taken them out, dusted them off, okay? Put them in a brown paper bag in a cool, dark spot. In autumn next year, so we're talk, talking April, May, you're going to take them out and you're going to plant them back into the garden. And that's the beauty of bulbs because when you plant them and you keep them in the same spot they will just come back for you year after year after year and one such bulb at the moment which you must get to your local builders to look for guys are beautiful amaryllis i mean come on amaryllis they they scream christmas it's like summer holidays whenever i see an amaryllis all i think about is oh oh christmas is coming because I have visions of big, red, voluptuous amaryllis on the veranda table, beautiful poinsettias. That is the Christmas spirit, and it screams summer to me. So get out there, look for your local, uh, look for amaryllis. And guys, if you want to know what to do with amaryllis, please, if you're on the Builders YouTube channel now, just type in planting bulbs, growing bulbs on the Builders YouTube channel because. I think I've got three or four or five video clips all on how to plant bulbs and look after them. And um, if you've never tried it, just give it a bash. Um, it's really easy. I mean, you can even grow these just in water. You've seen them at those other shops, you know, that, that other shop um, where they have them in glass bowls looking all very fancy. But you can do it yourself. Yeah, just a vase, some pebbles, and you pop the bulb in it. Yeah, add a bit of water. And the rest is easy. Okay, so so please do that because um, they are splendid. Our amaryllis have just started flowering um, in the garden because remember amaryllis go to sleep during winter. So there were bare pots and we just put mulch over them to keep them nice and snug. And they started shooting about three, four weeks ago. And hi, caramba, they are flowering at the moment. These big, delicious, voluptuous uh, red flowers that look spectacular. All right. Um, Joseph, uh, good morning. I uh, like yesterday, today and tomorrow. Oh my goodness. Have you seen how beautiful they are all around? We ever, do you know it's amazing? I mean, it, that's a plant that, that for me, um, it's a complete nostalgia. Um, my, my granny, uh, who lived in a tin house, true story, um, used to have one in her front garden below the, the, the flamboyant tree. And when I, when I smell yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's like, boom, it's like time travel. Instant, bang, I am back in that garden. Oh, and it's beautiful. It is beautiful. And you know what I worked out the other day? That I didn't have one in my garden. Shame on you, Tanya. Absolute shame on you. I scolded myself. In fact, I was walking through the garden center, and I said, I am so disappointed in myself. I do not have a yesterday, today, and tomorrow growing. So anyway. I bought one and we've planted it and it's going to be growing. So the question is, um, how do I plant it from a cutting? Ooh, okay. You're very brave if you're going to take cuttings of yesterday, today and tomorrow because they only work on semi-hardwood cuttings. So that is not tip cuttings. 
Um, yesterday and today and tomorrow do not do very well from tip cuttings. You've got to take a hardwood cutting. So that's actually part of the stem. Um, so you'll have to take it from part of the stem with a little bit of foliage, a wee wee bit of foliage, but it does take a very, very long time because they are slow growers. Personally, if I were you, I'd pop out to my local builders and just go and buy one, okay? Because you're gonna set yourself back. If you're gonna try from cuttings, you gotta be patient for like three years before you're gonna expect anything. Not my cup of tea, huh? No, no. Anyway, um, another question. Um, buh, 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 buh. Um, some of the fruit trees bought from nurseries already have fruit on them. Must I remove those fruit when planting the fruit tree? That's a very, very good question. Generally, you'll find that the ones that have got fruit in them are either going to be lemons or oranges. Um, I doubt any other fruit that you purchase in a, in, a, from, in a bag from a garden center from your local builders will have fruit on it. That's because lemons and oranges generally fruit incredibly young. What I would look out for, and it is a good question, say there are at the end of, the, of your stem, say there are four young fruit. Okay, so they're four young fruit, little guys, like the size of a marble. And do this for me because, and I know it sounds cruel, but you must do this. Remove half of the fruit. Even better, remove everything and leave one. Because what's going to happen is, especially when the tree is so young, it can't cope with all that fruit it, it can't cope with it it gets too heavy the branches get too heavy and you end up with many undersized superficial substandard fruit so it's like would you rather want one that's amazing and gorgeous and beautiful or have a whole lot of other little ones so the choice is up to you but what i would i really really would recommend that because you generally end up with far better fruit got better quality and better taste and that's what it comes down to is taste. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, don't, don't, if the fruit is quite established already, quite large, leave it on there. Leave it. Because why not reap the rewards? But if the fruit is smaller, then by all means, do what I've asked you to please do and remove at least 50% of the young fruit. Okay. Now, um, some other things I want to talk to you about. But before I get onto that, now, um, I get asked a lot of questions about how can we garden on a budget? How can we garden without spending so much money? And, you know, we were thinking about it the other day and we came up with this idea for a video. Um, and it, it was kind of weird because when you think about it, the thing that we've used in making the said thing, most of us have lying around in the back of our garden because we bought too many. Um, or we had a few left over. Um, so take a look at this. Um, uh, this is a sneak preview um, to the clip that is on the Builders YouTube channel. So take a look here. Just a little, little sneak peek for you. Thanks, Tanya. When gardening means DIY, we get something functional and aesthetically pleasing. Now this is one of the simplest and the quickest builds that I've ever made. A few pavers, fast creeds, and a few clamps. And here we are. Now, if you want to see how I made this, click the link in the description below. Over to you. Ah, so my people just told me that the description or the link or the something is in the description below. Anyway, you've got to click somewhere. Have I got it right? No, did I get it all wrong? Oh, they're laughing at me. They're laughing at me. Oh, the link to the video is in the description below. You see, I told, that's exactly what I said. I mean, what's ridiculous these people just did? You know, they, they tell me what to do continuously. Never. Anyway, you know what I mean. Anyway, so I know when I go to that part of the garden where like I store stuff, I found three pavers. It meant I just had to buy one more. I even found a pile of slate. Yeah. So you could make a pot just out of the slate. Guys, the options are endless. They really, really are endless. And for me, it's about being creative with what you've got. Um, find things because, yeah, that's the way we can garden. We can make it stretch, stretch, stretch. Okay, now I want to talk to you about this because a lot of you are going to have this plant in your garden. This is Leucanthemum. Now, Leucanthemum is, um, is also known as the Shasta Daisy. 
And I love a Shasta Daisy, but a Shasta Daisy is a true perennial now. So I would consider a Shasta Daisy to be something like a, oh, I'm going to bring it in here, like a carnation. Um, it would also work like, do I have another example? Yes, I do. Of a beautiful status. Okay, so these kind of, um, and the other one that is very, very similar to this would be yarrow. Now, Leucanthemums or Shasta daisy, they grow in, they multiply, they multiply, they send out roots and then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Same with this, this will send out more and it, this cluster will get bigger and bigger of the status, likewise the same as this carnation. It's important with plants like this and especially what else falls into this department is agapanthus. It's important to do the following with them to encourage them to continue performing and flowering and looking amazing. Some of you might have agapanthus and you'll see this season, if they do not perform, in other words, if they do not give you masses of flowers this coming summer, then you know that something has to get done. Okay, exactly the same with your Shasta daisies, exactly the same with this and with your status. If they are not performing, it means that they need division. Okay, they need dividing. And that's an important task, as important as pruning that we described earlier. And that is division. So how do you do it? Once the plant is finished flowering, when is that? Summer flowering. Autumn. Once they have finished flowering, that's an autumn. You will then lift these plants up. You will divide them and break them up into smaller plants. Prune the roots. Okay? Prune a bit of the top, replenish your soil, good compost, put in some bone meal. I had bone meal around here somewhere. Here we go. Make sure you put in some bone meal. If you've got dogs around, then don't. Put in super phosphate because it works better, okay? Well, it works better than the fact that your dogs aren't going to go digging up your garden. Um, replenish your soil, lots of compost. Make sure that you get um, your bone meal in and add one or two handfuls of an organic fertilizer, folks. Important and then you replant your younger plants that you've just split. So what have we done now? We've given them space, we've replenished the soil, we've given them a bit of great nutrition, we've fed the soil, we've conditioned the soil, and the plants will come away better. And you will find this, guys, in a lot of perennials. So please, if they're not performing, and they are the type that just grow and get more and more and more and more. So they make more babies. Um, that is telling you that they honestly, they really need to be lifted and divided, but don't do it now. Give them a chance through summer. See what happens. Um, but we see this time and time again with Agapanthus especially, and these guys and Yarrow. So those that send up more and more babies. Okay, so um, you can see, yeah, this is one plant here. So I can't even show you, actually. I would like to have shown you. But there is a video on the Builders channel on how to lift and divide agapanthus. So please have a look at that because that is going to give you the tips that you're going to need. Um, but don't worry. I'll remind you about it at the end of summer of what you need to do in your garden right now. A perennial, folks, that I just simply love and I can't get enough of the season. It's weird how we go through different stages in our, in our lives and what we love. And notice the stem here. Do you see the stem? No flowers on top. All it's doing is sucking energy out the plant. So just prune it off. It's important to get rid of these that are not giving you flowers or really just hanging about and being a bit of a waste. But beautiful status. It's called Limonium parisia. Um, the flowers are with these little white flecks can get cut and they can get simply just put in a vase without water because they keep their color. They can last for months and months on end. They're wonderful in the garden and as a combination, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to urge you and I'm going to tell you to do this. You use um, Shasta daisies in the front, you use status and then you fill in with plants like this. Now this is a dusty miller. Um, oh, this is a beautiful plant. This little guy, don't be, don't be fooled by its size. 
Little Dusty Miller, you'll find them in seedling packs like this at your local builders, or you will find them as grown plants. So you'll be able to buy them in a pot this big. You know, they'll be instant. They get, they get about that big, okay, that big in size. Imagine that gray, gray, white, purple. What a beautiful combination. Um, and, and you know, you don't have to use these same plants, but just think of the same combination, of a simpler combination when you're gardening, because we could swap that out, the white out, with alisum. So we could have alisum next to this, and we could have the gray along here. All right, so that's what I want you to think about. But perennials, guys, and if we're talking about budget gardening, let me tell you, perennials will save your bacon. And, and I mean that with the greatest respect because perennials, you can take cuttings of them, you can divide them. As I said, you can make more, just like with your Shasta. You can encourage them to grow further. And especially those like Agapanthus as well, they just develop and make more and more and more. And perennials add that burst of color um, without much effort. So you can have something flowering in your garden all year round because there are spring, autumn, summer, and winter flowering perennials um, that are all out there. So when purchasing, don't buy everything that's in flower. Buy some that aren't in flower so that you can get that beautiful staggering um, throughout the year. But I firmly believe in them, and I, and I cannot tell you the joy that they bring to, to my garden and to me um, by just having these plants in that pop through and give me surprises throughout the year. Folks, um, that's the hour gone. I actually don't know where it's gone to, um, but it is gone. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed spending the hour with me. It has gone by so fast. Remember to visit the blog on the Builders website for gardening inspiration, great articles and DIYs. And remember, we will answer all your questions. If I didn't get to them in today's live, we will answer them a little bit later. But folks, it's gardening season. It is the prime gardening season. Remember, remember to take time to put your bum on the grass. Sit down, sit down and enjoy the garden. Don't be running around so much. Sit down, enjoy it. As they say, stop to smell the roses. Um, till next time. And it's garden day. And garden day is on the 17th um, of October, guys, which is not, not next week. What are we? Monday's the 11th. It's like round the corner. Um, uh, I'll, uh, if you have a look, have a look on the YouTube channel, on the Builders YouTube channel, how I was planning on spending Garden Day with my two lads. Uh, it's, it's completely hysterical. Um, I put them, uh, tested their gardening skills and their flower crown skills and oh my word. Well, you have to watch the clip to see how it turned out. Folks, till next time I meet with you. Thank you for lending me your ears and your hearts. God bless you all and most importantly, happy gardening.